Britain has some very strange problems in that uh, we have a massive history, very well documented and recorded, and yet which is uh, attacked, in other words, and generally regarded as a huge forgery. Mm -hmm. The paradox with British history is there seems to be a preconceived mindset within an inaccurate framework. Mm -hmm. In other words, basically, the correct synthesis is not actually relevant to the actual tangible evidence which we've accumulated. Particularly as they relate uh, sites which are traceable, battlefields which are traceable, and all sorts of other buildings and ruins which are again traceable. Misguided political reasons, because mm -hmm. we have author the first in Warwickshire, England, and author the second in South Wales. So basically, rather than create a situation where people can benefit from it, they just basically try to rub it out right. completely. If we, if we look at it, we've got one or two salient points that have been attacked. One, we have an ancient British alphabet. Now this was wrongly attacked as being forged and fabricated in 1800. So in 1776, he's recalling an inscription on an ancient stone naming a king who lived around the year 200 AD in memorial stone and yet its uh, alphabet is not forged until 1800. So there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. This is what set us off to think, hey, hey, you know, there's something seriously wrong here. And we then searched and we found that all sorts of people had written and produced documents. Then we found Julius Caesar had described the alphabet. Now, hang on, post. this is getting a bit much. So we realized there was something very seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. So it was the discovery of this alleged forgery of the alphabet, which is not a forgery, that really gave the, the real act, like the atom bomb in Hiroshima, it blew everything apart, mm -hmm. that there's something seriously wrong. Then we've got things like the ancient bards of Britain. Again, a much abused volume, but in it, and this is an old book, is the same ancient alphabet. What date is that about? This one, 1906, I think, this is one of the later ones. There's one of 1848 here, 1906, that one. This, quoting ancient texts, this is 1848, ancient alphabet. And this guy is again a scholar, quoting ancient records. Now, why they've got away with this allegation that was only made around 1936? This new evidence, which Alan and I have brought to light, and Alan's been at this, incidentally, since for 60 years now. Mm -hmm. 60 years of research. His birthday was 80 last week. Mm -hmm. So he's, um, he's been he's a total expert. The Hawley family from Jerusalem arrived in Britain, and specifically to South Wales, in 33 AD. And it surprised us to find that the Church of Rome acknowledged this. And certainly um, Cardinal Baronius and Cardinal Alford around 1530, 1536, they were, they were saying that, you see. And of course, I, it's possible that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, didn't wake up to the danger. Right. <laughs> but none of us, they acknowledged this. And other sources uh, also then supported this. Mm -hmm. And we started finding manuscript evidence in Wales where, I'll read it out for you, yeah. uh, uh, this is a St. Caddock's genealogy, his father, his mother, and it goes back to the Virgin Mary and Bethany, the brother of Jesus of Nazareth, and Abelach. <laughs> Hang about. Right. Uh, is Abelach the Alabach? Al you see, the leading Jewish person in Alexandria, where there were way over a million Jews living, anciently, in, in the time of Jesus, was the Alabach. Mm -hmm. And it's a title, not a name, you see. And so that set us off in another direction. But this idea of descent from the Holy Family is peppered, peppered through the genealogies. And these are the most illustrious of the genealogies. This is the genealogy again of, of Owen, the big prince of Duffid, and his son, he's getting married, his father's how old there, how old good. Uh, and they say, after Amlach is a note, and it says, Amlach was the son of Beli the Great, and Anna his mother, who they say was a cousin to Mary the Virgin, the mother of Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it goes on and on, you see. So what book is that you've got there, Alan? 
that you're referring to? This would be the Harleian uh, 3859. Right. It's one of the most illustrious manuscripts we've got. It is the, it is one of the priceless things. Mm -hmm. And it lists a number of genealogies of the ancient kings, you see. We try to stick to the facts, the figures, the evidence as it is now emergent and more emergent in a more rapid progression now. Mm -hmm. And um, we must we think it's time, it's high time that the um, 17th, 18th and indeed 19th century still paragons and Victorian anachronisms are appropriately left far behind. Yeah. And we've got any evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, in genealogy number two, listing the wife who's going to marry this. Oh, in, that's oh, in, it actually, again, it traces back to Magnus Maximus, you see. And the son of Magnus Maximus is Idenet in this case. It actually is the son of Arthur. It's Magnus Maximus, Arthur, and then Idenet. They skipped him. And is that Arthur the First or Arthur, Arthur the Second? Arthur the First. Okay. No, in, in what year is Arthur the First, Alan? Uh, he would be born around, uh, we would think, uh, given the date of his father's birth, is uh, around 345, something like that. Perhaps the most cogent evidence is what the stone, the memorial accession stones we found. Mm -hmm. For example, the one that was <coughs> revealed in Atherstone in Warwickshire has been examined in a laboratory. It's been examined by a professional qualified archaeologist. Mm -hmm. and it's, it, has been, it has been authenticated. This particular stone is on the um, back of the Holy Kingdom book, which we co-authored with Adrian Gil mm -hmm. Il Gilbert. Oldbury in Atherstone, Warwickshire, is where King Arthur I will probably be entombed. Mm -hmm. And he died uh, around again, give or take a year, year 400. Mm -hmm. uh, he is definitely uh, in list number four. You've got Maxim, Magnus Maximus, who uh, kills Gratian, you know, and his son is Arthur, Arthur I, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, Arthur I, uh, who killed the ruler who killed Gratian, the king of the Romans. Uh, okay? Well, Arthur and Magnus Maximus did invade Gaul in 383. They did confront Gratian, the Roman Emperor, at Soissons, 12 miles from Paris. They did defeat his armies and Arthur chased into Lyons, lugged him and killed him. So we have Arthur I, son of Magnus Maximus. So we knew immediately, hey, we, we've got, uh, must have two King Arthurs. Right. This is in King List number 28, and this is repeated in numbers of manuscripts, Tudric with Theodric, correct. He figures hugely in the histories. Uh, Morris, Moorig, Moirig, and then you get Arthur. Arthur is, you know, Arthur, Arthur II. Second. The Vivian archaeologists, the Boots of England, the Anglo-Saxon Saxon Chronicles, uh, Geoffrey of Westminster, Henry of Huntington. There's a plethora of documents mm -hmm. and um, references to these, this particular King Arthur II. Mm -hmm. You see, so they're appearing, and if you put the genealogy together, from these lists, out you get it. What year are we talking? Arthur II, he, he turns out to be born 503, and he dies almost certainly in 579. Mm -hmm. So, once you've tackled the problem of where to start looking, mm -hmm. you then have another problem of, uh, you know, getting the dates right. Mm -hmm. Now, another source turns out to be the Brutes of England, the official histories of the English people. Now, these, are, again, have been much maligned and uh, abused mm -hmm. because they don't say what the universities want them to say. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure if you could turn the clock back, the scholars would be right for them. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, in here you have Wadges, the Brutes of England, who huge chunks on King Arthur. Mm -hmm. They're talking about Arthur II. Actually, they're talking about Arthur II and Arthur I. Mm -hmm. They haven't managed to disentangle them. But in the case of Arthur II, they actually say, and when King Arthur had thus his knights feasted about April after the next sowing, he's over in Brittany, he came again into Britain, his own land, and when after Whitsuntide next sowing by counsel of his barons, he would be crowned King of Glamorgan. That's a bit of a bold statement, isn't it? 
But they also give the date of his death, you see. And the date is pages and pages about this guy. He's supposed to be non-existent. <laughs> the funny thing is everybody writes, ooh. Mm -hmm. And this is like ancient stuff. And it's been written in England, right? Uh, they actually say that he dies in 500 and... I work at 46. It's impossible. You see, what they're doing, the Brits dated their sort of dating from the crucifixion. They were agnostic Christians of a sort. So, year one is 34 AD. Mm -hmm. right? The Roman Church dated their Perhaps. calendar from the birth of Jesus. So you've got a 33-year gap. Once you realize that, all this muddle, and there is a tremendous muddle in Dark Age British history, it all falls into place. It's not muddled anymore. You see? And once you realize 546 plus 33 is 579, you're in business. So the Bruce of England were another source, and I'm giving you a rundown on there are dozens of books and places, right? The other thing is that um, once we've established the two Arthurs, we start to get a dating pattern right. You see, the Battle of Baden is not 570 AD. The Battle of Baden is about 550 AD. It's 33 years later. And the Battle of Camlan slips backwards, right? It's not 535, it's about 568, something like that. And again, that makes sense in the histories. The Welsh histories then begin to make sense. They previously said these histories are terrible, they're muddled, you know. They're not. The dating has to be put right. Mm -hmm. But I must emphasize, Alan has been a passionate historian for 60 years. Mm -hmm. So I think, he, it's, I think after 60 years of historical research, I think he should know something about it. Mm -hmm. The records are multitudinous. What I'm saying is, is there are sources all over the place which have not been properly used. Uh, Badass, written uh, 1800s, again, by Oxford scholars, and again they exhibit and they describe the origins and the where and wherefore of this much maligned alphabet. And the alphabet of being alleged a forgery was the main weapon used to discredit histories. Now, there are stones in Wales, and in Scotland, and in England, that contain the cardboard alphabet written on them. Mm. And sometimes the alphabet is mixed with Latin letters. So, but they couldn't get a British sound from the Latin letter. They put a cardboard alphabet in. Right. Uh, they got round that one with a man named Collingwood, who's from Northumberland, of all places. And he said that um, all carving of stones and ancient stones started in Northumberland in Britain. And they then spread, and they then taught the Irish how to carve stones. The Irish will be pleased. Right? And when the Welsh wanted a stone carved and inscribed, they sent for the Irish to come and do it for them. So when you get a stone in Wales with Colburn on, or with a mixed Latin Colburn text, it's Latin and Irish. Now this has caused pandemonium. Because you lose the stone of King Moirig, Morris, as the second's father. It's there, obviously. And where is that stone, Alan? It's in Margamabi. You lose the stone of King Tithbald. And you lose the stone of King Tudrig. Because the names have been... <laughs> they're in Cochran. They're not Irish at all. And the allegation that the Welsh couldn't carve a bloody stone and needed an Irishman to come and do it is disgraceful. But the archaeologists are mainly English, and they love this. Uh, you've got the land of charters. Uh, the land of charters do record King Arthur, yes. And he makes land grants. And his father does, and his grandfather does, and his sons and grandsons do. So the idea, the idea is the land of charters. They're in Latin and then translated into Welsh. And uh, they, they clearly exhibit grants by all sorts of people, including Arthur II. So what di where does that date from, the land of charters? They were compiled uh, down the centuries as they were made. They start uh, the Lancarvan Abbey charters around 400. Uh, these seem to commence around the 
470 either on there, maybe a little later. And they go on to 1120. In the margins of these charters, they often wrote notes of historical importance. You know, the charter written down the middle, they write all sorts of notes on the margins. Mm -hmm. So we, what they do, they record the charters given by the kings and major princes to the church. Mm -hmm. And they also say who was there, his brother was there, his father was there, or his son was there. And you get a cascade of the kings down through the centuries. And so you've got a comprehensive list of the kings of Glamorgan and Gwent, South East Wales, and the Bishop of Lambeth. There's nothing like it. Be it known to the clergy and people of southern Britain that Athwys, that's him, right, king of the region of Gwent, granted the God and St. Dabricius and St. Tylo, Tylo's his uh, first cousin, Dabricius Duffley crowned him. Uh, uh, in the hand of Bishop Comereg, he's a local bishop, right? The Church of Kinbach and so on and so on. King Arthuris went round the whole territory in its circuit, sprinkling of the dust with a sepulchre of St. Kinbach. And it goes on. He parades round the entire circuit of thing, And the king alone carried the gospel on his back and confirmed forever the arms that had been given for the soul of his father, Moedic. He's given the church a bit of land so they can pray for his daddy. And it says who's there, uh, the, all the abbots and bishops who attend and all the relatives of the king who attend this ceremony. So what you do, you, you, get a, you, you can build up a who's who of the entire sort of royal family. Mm. This is a copy Sorry. of the Mavernian archaeology. And uh, again, they fall, these books fall apart if you use them. This is, a couple of, this is 200 years old and more, see. There's a whole wadge in the front of ancient poetry, masses, over 230 ancient poems, some of them very long, right? And a lot of them deal with Arthur, and the, two, the burial of Arthur and his death. And the information in these poems is massive, on, because they, they deal with numbers of princes, their exploits, and their deaths, and this sort of thing. Can you give us an example, Alan? One of the famous ones is a dialogue between Arthur and a fellow named um, Lulot. And Lulod is important because Lulod means coloured man. It means a brown-skinned man, not a black man, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot here by Taliesin, who is the Merlin figure. Between Arthur, son of Uther, and his nephew, Lulod, the son of Madoc, the son of Uther. Okay? That's what it's between. Right. So Arthur's got a brother named Madoc, who is Madoc Malfran, Madoc of the Seaweeds, or Madoc the Cormorant. Okay? He's uh, a sailor, obviously. And uh, it goes on. Now, Arthur asks a question. Lulod, Oilod, he answers three times. Arthur asks another question, and Lulod answers. And it goes on like that, question and answer, right the way through. Okay. They're talking about a great, great strange land out across the ocean, which is vast. And there are huge mountain ranges, great lakes, massive rivers. And Arthur's asking, well, are there kings ruling this place? And he says, no. There's no, there's no kings. You know. so, are there coast guards guarding it? He says, no. Nobody. Uh, it's there for the taking, you see. And he, he's planning. You can see what's coming. He's planning an expedition, you see. And you think it's America? Well, Arthur then sails out of Milford Haven with 700 ships. Oh, where is he going? We piece together the story out of the poetry and out of the lives of the saints a lot of the, the various histories, because there you see there, there are six ancient histories in here. Six, mm -hmm. which are generally ignored. And they contain massive information. They interlock with the poetry. They interlock with the lives of the saints. They seem and appear to be accurate. And where it's possible to compare them with the Roman records, they tie up. Mm -hmm. And so we've got six histories, several hundred poems, right? And these are then you've got lives of the saints, and as they give the, the saint, you couldn't be a saint unless you were royal or noble family. Ordinary people couldn't be saints. So you have the saint's father and mother and their ancestry all listed down, all the genealogies of saints, you see. Well, these are all people from the royal and noble families. So it adds further to this agglomeration and cementing together. Now, I must emphasize... One of these experts said that a book is 
required a book in a sort of a brave heart sort of format a, a fictional book to sum up the the, the welsh king arthur we've king done Arthur's. a book on that it's the author the war king mm -hmm. this is the tier it's a, everybody who's read that thinks it's absolutely awesome. All of your other books are non-fiction, or they're they're, sci they're they're basically historical research and, and evidence driven. Yeah. But that Arthur one the Walking is a f historical novel based on fact. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, Professor Morgan did um, say the necessity for such a book, mm -hmm. and there is a book it, 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 which has already been written. Yeah. In one sale over the saints, he arranges the marriage of Gladys with Brocken and Brecken, who's his first cousin. And Brocken and, and Gladys get married. Gladys is the daughter of Gwynthru, who's a pirate living in Newport. Well, there's no Newport on the earth. They, when they were digging out Newport docks, they found the remains of ancient ships in the mud, but they didn't bother preserving. Arthur has a celebrated meeting with Gildas, because he executed Gildas' brother, Hoyle, cut his head off. And so he goes to Lancarbon Abbey, which is 10 miles west of Cardiff. And he and Gildas have a celebrated meeting. So it's, it's peppered everywhere. Sinultid is the first cousin of King Arthur. In the life of Ilted, you get King Arthur. You published quite a prominent book in 1986 called Arturius Rex Discovered. Arturius Rex Dis Dis um, Discovered is, the, is a more of a popular edition, hardcover. Mm -hmm. It depicts the, the accession memorial stone of King Arthur the second on the front cover in fact mm -hmm. and, um, and it, it was a very popular well received book at least in South Wales but now it's it's very popular on the internet and um, everybody who reads it thinks it's absolutely excellent and, and of course that book was written before the King Arthur burial cross was uncovered or was, was excavated that is the point it was done before the excavation so we couldn't be making things up. Mm -hmm. uh, in Nennius, who was a celebrated historian, as read on the 800, and in the life of Sinotid, the burial is described in detail. He's first brought in by ship up the river Aweni, and he's placed and buried in a cave. He's later taken out of the cave and placed and buried under a church. The church of St. Peter's is associated with King Arthur II, we went along, saw that the, the ruin was in the right spot, and that all the place names around it were right. Portrait, a uh, uh, supreme place. Uh, uh, you get uh, the names uh, where the, the great massacre occurred is there. It's Had you already named the site in that book of St. Peter's the, Church? We mentioned the site of St. Peter's Church. There's right. photographs of St. Peter's Church within the book. Mm -hmm. We mentioned the stone in the book, which was found in, a, in an excavation, a pre-excavation in 19... In 86, just before the book was published, and that's right. what actually inspired us to proceed immediately to publish the book. See, in Wales, you get fields on a tithe map. A tithe map was drawn for the church, and that. And each field is drawn very carefully, and the acreage is expressed. And the field's given a number. Then the tithe book gives the number of the field, its acreage, who owns it, who may farm it if it's not the owner, and the amount of tithe that's got to be paid to the church. So all Welsh fields, in, certainly in South Wales, had names, and they were named for events. So you can actually read the history in the land. It tells you where the beer tent was, where the quarrel started, and where the massacre occurred, in the, the tithe maps. Mm -hmm. And you can find information in all sorts of places if you know how to look. The sword-shaped stone was actually part of the fabric, right. and the, the archaeologists have written up a report actually revealing where it came from in the war. Right. It's Caracarad, the castle of Caradoc. There's the ruins of an ancient castle there. Of course, the archaeologists don't even know it's there. The tower bases are in the fields and the walls. Uh, King Caradoc, the first who fought the Romans, uh, the highest spot on the hill is Twin Caradoc. There's a big grave mound there. St. Peter's Church, the excavation in 1990, um, one of our there was about 50 people involved in the excavation altogether, but one of the, basically the groundwork, as Richard Melbourne actually found a electrum cross. And sadly, he's passed away now, but he found that, and um, that is one of the most, perhaps if not the most compelling, tangible artifacts 
we found it at the site in that excavation. And it's inscribed Pro uh, Anima Artorius. It is indeed, yes. Which means for the soul of Arthur. Yeah. Now we have had that um, tested, tested, thoroughly tested, and it's typical of artifacts of that period. Now, now the important thing is that this was dug up after you had purchased the land, because you purchased that land because you thought that was the resting place of King Arthur II. And then at some point later it was excavated and then you found this cross. Correct. Basically, we thought it warranted excavation in, in view of the, all the evidence which we had already accumulated. We assembled a formidable team and one of the basically labourers really just happened to find the cross. It's, oh, it's above Brinner, uh, the village of Brinner. Which is Hallett. in South West Wales. It's in South Wales, uh, in mid, I'd say mid Glamorgan. It's there, anybody can go and see it. And then it leads on to other, you can start reading the type maps, you can find out where the loot is. <laughs> there's a giant sort of bolt shape in the ground and there's a grave mound there. And Uther Pendragon is buried in the ground, mound in the great circle at Kai Karadok. That is Kai Karadok. Because the castle of Karadok's there, the grave of Karadok's there. And St. Peter's Church is at Kai Karadok. The name of that church is St. Peter's. Now, Vortigen's ambassadors met Emrys Wedding, the crown prince, Emrys, right? The jeweled prince, right? And his mother at St. Peter's Church. I think that it would set them up with a tourist. There are only three million people there. It's the same size as Birmingham. <laughs> it's suburbs, right? And uh, I think it would set them up for all time as a tourist mecca because we, we've touched on a fraction of us. A tourist mecca? Oh, yeah. I would think at a minimum 30,000 jobs. See, a tourist job's permanent. You can't take the pyramids away. People don't see them. But a factory is not permanent. These larger books, you know, this... This was written for Charles II of England, as a copy of it. It gives his genealogy. And he traces his right to be King of England back to the Prince's Wales. And all through the piece, the Duke of York, the Duke of Northumberland, all of them, they all trace their ancestry back to Welsh. It's, it, it's there if you want to look at it. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it every possible way. Uh, get the industry set up and running, try to promote the construction of hotels. Uh, there are numbers of sites right through Wales. It's not just one area, it, it, although there's a concentration there. There are sites all over the place, which are Arthur 1 and Arthur 2, and into the Midlands. Uh, get the, the, the tourist industry on its feet and start it going. Make the doodads to sell to people. Don't let the people in Hong Kong make tourists maps or, you know, there's a minimum of 20,000 jobs in this. And I said, well, you don't even know half of it yet. If you live in South Wales and would like to see something done about this and many of the other historical sites, then why not contact your council or parliament? After all, they are supposed to work for you. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.